uh, through this uh, atomic spectra. Okay, so there are two kinds of atomic spectra mm, that, that one looks at. Think of atomic spectra as uh, as the as thumb impressions. So, for example, humans have these thumb impressions, right? Which which are technically, I mean, it's not really one for one, but uh, they, they you can identify humans through their thumb impressions to a certain extent. You can uh, similarly different atoms will have different characteristic spectra. And that's how you essentially figure out what exact element there is inside any system. For example, if you, if you want to know that what elements exist in a galaxy that is far, far away. So you'll see the light that is coming in, you'll pass it through a prism, you'll break it up into the constituents and you'll see which ones are present and which ones are not present. And hence you'll be able to figure out what exact element is is in higher proportions or, or lower proportion or what combination of elements are present in the galaxy that is far far away. So there are two kinds of atomic spectra. One is the line emission spectra. As the name suggests, this happens when the atom is emitting light. Uh, when would atoms um, start emitting light? Well, they would start emitting light when an atom, when an atomic gas, mostly these are gases that work, or vapor, at low pressure is excited. usually by passing an electric current or just by heating the gas if that also works um, you just need to excite uh, the electrons in some way uh, so you essentially need to impart some energy into the system in some way uh, current current through it come the gas or vapor usually emits radiation of a certain specific wavelength only. It consists of a few bright, a few bright lines in the background. Uh, so, what will be the wavelength? Um, well, we, you can calculate the wavelength from the frequency. And you know what the frequency is already going to be from the third postulate that Bohr came up with. It's just going to be EI minus EF, the initial to final. So let's say um, let's say you have a gas. You have gas which is made of hydrogen. And, and you know how the hydrogen uh, lines, the, the orbits look like, right? N is equal to 1, N is equal to 2 n is equal to three and so on and so forth let's say let's say you have a gas of hydrogen and you've excited the the atom somehow you pass some current through it you, you've heated it up what does that do well that that would impart energies uh, to these electrons and and let's just say the electron went up to the second or n is equal to orbit well now now the electron is in the, in the n is equal to orbit, but the n is equal to orbit is not really the most stable orbit that the electron can be. The most stable orbit would be n is equal to one orbit. Why? Because it has lower energy. If you see the energy is 
E in the nth thing is minus 13, uh, minus 13.6. Let me just write this again. Minus 13.6 over n square in electron volts. For n is equal to 1, it's minus 13.6. For n is equal to 2, oh, well, this is 3.4 approximately, minus 3.4. So you realize that this is negative, so it's, it's a lower energy state. So the electron would want to be in the lower energy state, so, so it, will, it will just come down, releasing a photon. Releasing a photon of how much energy? Of energy this minus this, essentially. The higher minus the lower energy and uh, once you and that is the energy so hence you can go ahead and calculate what the wavelength of this light is going to be a collection of this would give you uh, essentially some electrons would have gone up to n is equal to two in, in some other atom nearby the electron would have gone up into n is equal to three in some other atom which is even more excited should would have gone to n is equal to four or n is equal to five or n is equal to six so essentially what you will see is a lot of uh, transfers from n is equal to 5, let's say, to n is equal to 1, or n is equal to 4 to n is equal to 1, or n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1, or n is equal to 2 to n is equal to 1. But note that all of these, n is equal to 5, n is equal to 4, n is equal to 3, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 1, all of them have certain energy. We know what energy that is. That energy is given by this formula here. So this transfer from this to this will release a certain energy. So it will release a photon of a certain frequency or a certain wavelength. So what you will see, you will see a band. You will see a band of whatever frequency that is or whatever color associated to that wavelength that is for n is equal to 5. Then you'll see one band for n is equal to four. Then you'll see one band for n is equal to three, one band for n is equal to two. On, on a background, that is going to be a dark background. So you'll see these colors, lines, essentially, uh, on this black background. And that is essentially what a line emission spectra is. It is, it is the emission of, of radiation from, from the atoms because of this excitation. Now, this was about emission. Now, let's talk about the opposite of emission, absorption. Um, so, the other one is line absorption. 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 There's a P here, not a B. Uh, spectrum. As I said, it's essentially the same thing we're using the same fact that there are these energy orbits um, and these are the orbits. We're going to um, use it in the opposite way as you realize. Now, what happens here, instead of heating up the gas, you're shining light on the gas and you're shining white light on the gas. So when white light, passed through a gas, through a gas or vapor, we observe or we observe a white background, yes, a bright background so opposite of the previous case in the previous case there was a dark background here you have a bright background and previously you had bright lines here you have dark lines the, the lines that you saw in the previous case in the light emission spectrum are now the exact same lines which are absorbed why they are the case why that is the case we'll discuss that uh, let me just finish uh, the, the definition. We observe a bright background crossed, uh, crossed by a few dark, dark lines. The dark lines signifies
ties the wavelength um, the absorbed wavelength absorbed wavelength by the gas and that's what is called the absorption spectrum so essentially what is happening here you again have those orbits n is equal to 1 n is equal to 2 n is equal to 3 and so on and so forth 3 n is equal to 4 and dot dot, dot. now what you are doing is your let's say the electron is in the first orbit most stable it's in the ground state enjoying its life now what you do is you shine light through this gas so you have you have this gas here you have a lot of gas here and you 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 have this source of light um, and you essentially shine shine light through here and this is white white light so what what does white light mean white light means that it has all the frequencies that are possible um, in the in the visible range but but white light essentially means that all frequencies are present if all frequencies are present then your background let's say you have the background let's say it's in, it's in 3d so it passes through this and it hits this um, the screen at the back most of the light will pass through so essentially that is why the background will be bright only things only the frequencies that won't pass through will be the ones which are exact in the sense that they are the exact frequencies which correspond to the energy difference between any jump so let's say the energy of this we know that the energy of this is uh, minus 30.6 and this is minus 3.4 if the energy of the of the photon that is coming in if the frequency or the wavelength is such that it's exactly equal to this gap if it is exactly equal to this gap then this electron will absorb that uh, photon it will just absorb that photon and it will just go up to the state and hence um, in the background you won't see that frequency that particular frequency would be gone and those are the dark lines that i'm talking about the first dark line will correspond to n is equal to 1 to n is equal to 2 there will be another one from n is equal to 1 to n is equal to 3 there will be another one from n is equal to 1 to n is equal to 4 so corresponding to all these gaps you will see lines so essentially the same idea but in opposite ways uh, emission is when you're exciting the electron so that when it comes down from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it releases that energy. And in the absorption case, you're shining light so that it absorbs the energy and that uh, that particular frequency you're not able to see on the screen. Let's write a small discussion on this. Uh, let me clear this all. Discussion. First point. Missing wavelengths, as I said, are same as the wavelengths present in the emission. Uh, let me write it in a better way. The missing wavelengths in the absorption spectrum. Absorption spectrum are exactly the same as the as the bright lines or the or the lines that you see on the back background. Uh, in the absorption emission spectrum. So the lines are going to be, if the, if the gas is the same, the lines are going to be exactly in the same places, whether you're looking at the emission spectrum or you're looking at the absorption spectrum. Because as we realize that we're still talking about the underlying same system, the system of these uh, these orbits of the hydrogen. And secondly, 
uh, every gas, every gas or vapor has its own characteristic line. Characteristic, characteristic line um, which comes through the emission slash absorption line emission or absorption uh, spectrum. which shows that the line spectra can serve, as I said, uh, as a fingerprint as a fingerprint for identifying Identifying um, the classification of the gas, um, uh, identifying the constituents of the gas. And so, what the bloody hell? Of the gas. Okay, these two things make sense. First thing saying that both uh, the lines have to be the same and the second one, you can use this as a fingerprint, like a little fingerprint. Okay, now, now next step, we understand that there is a spectra and how do we see that spectra is we do shining light if you want to see the emission spectra if you want to see the absorption spectra or heat the thing up or pass some current through it if you want to see the um, the emission spectra but the next uh, sorry um, the next obvious step is to classify the spectrum how how what is one of the uh, basic schemes to essentially classify uh, the spectra that's essentially what we're going to do here. Uh, classification of uh, spectrum. Okay, how are we going to classify it? Well, remember when when I gave you the example, uh, when I gave you the example of these things, of these uh, lines, what I said was that um, either you're starting from the ground state, n is equal to one state, and going to the n is equal to two state, or is the n is equal to three state, or the n is equal to four state. If you're talking about absorption spectra, or if you're talking about emission spectra, let, let's just let's just from now on only talk about emission spectra. Let's not really talk about absorption spectra. We let's keep it at the back of our minds that both are exactly the same because it's the same lines that is at the end we're talking about. So if there is a classification that is for the emission spectra, it's going to be the same classification for the absorption spectra, right? So let's just talk about emission, which is essentially talking about um, n is equal to two, two n is equal to one. So the electron was in n is equal to two uh, orbit and it comes down to n is equal to one, or it was in n is equal to three orbit and it comes down to n equal to one, or is go, was in the n is equal to four orbit, and it comes down to n is equal to one. All these, all these lines, all these lines, um, all these lines are called, um, are characterized in one way. So if you're in any N and you're going to N is equal to one, these are characterized by what is called line in series. Now, what the next step you can do to classify it, we realize that this is only is equal to n is equal to one. So what if we classify everything that comes down to n is equal to two? So for example, um, what about the energy when let's say it was in n is equal to three, n is equal to two, n is equal to one, and then it comes down to n is equal to two. It just stays here. 
because that's a stable uh, that is where it it might be stable or it was in n is equal to 3 and it comes down to um, sorry n is equal to 4 and it comes down to n is equal to or it was in n is equal to 5 and it comes down to n is equal to 2 so from n to n is equal to 2 what is this called this is called the bomber series bomber similarly from n to n is equal to 3 it's called the bastion bastion series and from any n to n is equal to 4 um, it's called the bracket So these are obviously, I mean, as the name suggests, they're named after the people who essentially discovered that these lines exist. And from any n to n is equal to five, it's called P fund the series. It's called the P fund series. Now, this this n is obviously not any n. This n has to be greater than whatever n you have here. So as in and obviously n cannot be zero so n will be always greater than one here but in the in the balmer series n is equal from going from n is equal to one to n is equal to two will actually just correspond to the line series because you're going from n is equal to one to n is equal to two it's exactly saying is exactly the same as going from n is equal to two to n is equal to one it's the same energy so it's actually a part of the lyman series and not a part of the balmer series so here n should be greater than two here n should be greater than 3, here n should be greater than 4, here n should be greater than 5. So it's from the higher thing coming down to the fourth one for bracket um, or the higher level coming down to n is equal to 5 for P fund. So this is essentially how you classify the spectrum. Okay, so now this is how you classify it. Oh, actually, actually let's, let's go back. Um, now, what, what else can we do here? Now, the, the next step, the next obvious step is to actually just put in the numbers and let's just see what happens. We know that the energy that is going to be released or that is going to be absorbed, uh, E, which is H nu, is just going to be the differences between EI and EF from where it was initially. So let's say it was in the third orbit and it comes down to the second orbit for the Barman line, let, let's just say. So uh, the energy of the third orbit minus the energy of the second orbit will be the energy that is released in the in, in the photon or in the, yeah, in the photon that comes out or in the radiation that comes out. So let's put in these numbers. Let's put in the energy numbers and let's actually calculate if uh, the formula for whatever wavelength or whatever frequency of light that actually comes out. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that using the third postulate of Bohr's. Um, uh, it's called the spectral series of the hydrogen atom. Remember, all of this is just true for the hydrogen atom. How it changes for other atoms, we'll talk about it in, in some time. Okay, so when electron and electrons in hydrogen atom jumps not electrons when there's only one electron in the hydrogen atom <laughs> when the electron in hide in the hydrogen atom. Ayyo. okay the hydrogen atom uh, jumps from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. The difference in energy the difference uh, in energy of the two orbits i am not able to read this level 
um, to two orbitals. is emitted in the form in the form of radiation so essentially you're going from ei so the ith state let's say you're going from the ith state um, to the jth state where i is obviously greater than j so you're in some I state, which is at a high energy level to go down to some J state. So the energy that is released is just EI minus EJ, correct? Um, so what do you have? You have H nu should be equal to EI minus EJ. Let's put in the numbers. We, we remember, do you remember what EI was? We did the whole calculation minus 13.6 uh, was minus 36.6 by n square. Yes, but let's actually put in the the constants that there were as well. So let me remind you what this was. So the energy in the ith orbit it will be one by four pi epsilon naught whole squared um, m. E to the power four divided by n i squared h cross squared. This is what you were getting for the energy in the ith orbit uh, minus the energy in the jth orbit, which is again minus of one over four pi epsilon naught whole squared m e to the power 4 divided by n j squared um, h cross squared. Now, let's take what literally everything is common except for, for n i and n j and let's take it out. What do you have? Um, the minus sign, let's just absorb this minus sign inside and and let's alternate it again so that the whole thing is just positive. So what do we get? You get one by four pi epsilon naught whole squared m e to the power four divided by h cross squared multiplied by what is the positive uh, quantity that you'll get? It's n j squared. Uh, the positive this is minus sign here, the minus sign here, so it will make a plus sign minus the one by n i squared. So it's actually dependent on on the difference between the ratios of the squares. It's not a very, very simple function. It's actually a slightly, slightly complicated function. This is this is H nu. This is the frequency. Um, now, if you if you want to calculate the the wavelength, well, wavelength and frequency we know are related to each other. How are they related to each other? Uh, nu times lambda is just the speed of light. Lovely. So let's let's use the fact that this is nu is equal to c by lambda. C by lambda. So h c by lambda is just equal to one by four pi epsilon naught whole square m e to the power four divided by h cross square. All of that is common. We multiplied by in brackets one by n j squared minus one by n i squared. J is the final, so one by the final the in which you're ending up, that is the first term minus in which you're coming from. It should be like that if you think about it and if you actually put in the numbers, you'll realize uh, why it is exactly like that. Um, so this implies one by lambda is just equal to what one by four pi epsilon naught whole squared m e to the power 4 divided by there is an h c here and an h cross square here again divided by 1 by n j squared minus 1 by n i squared now notice all of this all of these things here m is a constant e is a constant epsilon naught is a constant obviously 4 pi is a constant h is a constant h cross is also a constant and c is also a constant so all of these things are just constants 
let's say that this whole constant is some constant r r h to be precise and this whole constant is what we'll call as the rydberg constant so let me just clear all of this and try this again you have 1 by lambda is equal to uh, m e to the power 4 divided by 4 by epsilon not whole squared h cross squared and h c we get here multiplied by 1 by n f squared minus 1 by n i squared these are n's and not h's so all of this i'm said was a constant this is r h or the rydberg's rydberg's constant the value of rydberg's constant is um, r h is 1.0967 and dot 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 obviously it's an rational number multiplied by 10 to the power 7 units meter inverse why meter inverse because it's in the numerator all of this all of this thing here is dimensionless and this has dimensions of meter inverse because lambda has dimensions of meter meters so rh should have dimensions of meter inverse okay uh, so at the end what did we get 1 by lambda is just equal to rh Times one by n f squared minus one by n i squared. So lambda is the wavelength. So now, as I said, we have classifications for all of these things. Um, we've classified it in terms of uh, where it's going to end end up in terms of the Lyman series, the Baumann series, the Parsons series, the bracket series, and the P fund series. Let's go one by one. let's put in the numbers and let's see what essentially happens let's is first talk about the lyman series remember the lyman series was when you come back to the n is equal to 1 orbit uh, n is equal to 2 n is equal to 3 n is equal to 4 so essentially you come down from wherever you are coming down you are coming down from any n but you are coming down to the first orbit so your 1 by lambda which is just your rh times 1 by nf squared minus 1 by ni squared final minus initial so final you know for this uh, the final nf is always equal to 1 so lyman series nf the final where you are ending is always equal to 1 and ni is essentially where you are coming from so ni can be equal to 2 it can be equal to 3 it can be equal to 4 and so on and so forth it can go up to infinity so um let's put in the value of nf here you have rh which is the rydberg constant again 1 by 1 squared minus 1 by ni whole squared so what do you get you get simply rh 1 minus 1 by n i squared lovely um this is what the wavelength for the lyman series is going to be it just depends on where it's um, where the electron is initially coming from let's figure out what the longest wavelength can be so the longest wavelength will be the smallest frequency or the smallest energy the smallest energy difference so the smallest energy difference will be from n i is equal to 2 right so if it's just going from n i is equal to 2 to 1 that's the smallest gap that one can think of n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1 is obviously bigger than the gap between n is equal to 2 to n is equal to 1 so this is going to correspond to the longest wavelength and let's just put in and see how much uh, it's going to be Mm, it's going to be R H multiplied by one minus one by two squared, which is one by four. So R H is one minus one by four, which is just three by four. So it's just three by four times R H. So 
um, the inverse of this. So lambda is going to be mm, four divided by three R H. Know that R H is a constant. So now you can just put in the value of R H. What is the value of R H? It was give it to you right? one point something. Yes, or oh, one point oh nine. 0.09 into 10 to the power of 7. Uh, do me a favor, put in the value of RH here and tell me what you get uh, as lambda. Use a calculator, please, if you want. Or if you can do it in your head, that's also good. Tell me what the value of lambda would be. So this is the longest lambda in the Lyman series. So it's, it's essentially 14 micrometers. Yes. So 14 micrometers, that's a, that's a big ass um, wavelength. What about the shortest wavelength? The shortest, the shortest wavelength would be the highest energy. And the highest energy would be from where? Well, if it's coming from n is equal to infinity, if it's literally coming from uh, some other place. It's it wasn't bound by the when when I say n is equal to infinity, it just means that it wasn't bound. It wasn't in the hydrogen atom. It was the electron was outside, and then it gets captured by this by the nucleus. Um, so from n is equal to infinity to n is equal to one, this electron is coming. Uh, so your value of your value of one over lambda would just be equal to rh one by one minus one by infinity squared which is one by a very big number so inverse of a very big big number is a very very small number let's just say it's it's small enough to be equal to zero so this is just rh one by lambda so this implies lambda so the shortest uh, wavelength will be just one by rh so in the Lyman series the wavelength is going, the minimum wavelength is going to be one by RH and the maximum wavelength is going to be four by three um, divided by RH. Do you have any idea of what, what range is this? Uh, yes, what what range in the spectrum? You remember ki humne ultraviolet or uh, infrared or usme pura spectrum we divided. Uh, so what range is this? 10 to minus seven would be what range? Okay, it's another one. Okay, so it's just going to be ultraviolet. This is the essentially the ultraviolet region. Wavelength from one by RH to four by three RH. This is just going to be the UV region. So this kind of a series, so this part of this uh, of the series, this class, this particular classification, uh, which was discovered by Mr. Lyman, uh, most probably a doctor Lyman, um, the Lyman series, always. Uh, lies in the ultra wired range. So this n is equal to two to n is equal to one. This particular line, or as we figured out that the longest wavelength line, is also what is called the k alpha line. So how are we going to name it? All the al uh, all the Lyman series lines will be named with the letter k. So if somebody says k. Um, the K alpha line, if, if there is a question which says that the K alpha line has uh, this much wavelength. So you already understand that it's K, so it has to be Lyman. So it has to come down to N is equal to one and alpha, since alpha is the first letter, it has to come down from N is equal to two. The first one from N is equal to two to N is equal to one is called K alpha from N is equal to three to N is equal to one is called K beta. N is equal to four to N is equal to one is called K gamma. And so these are called the K lines, K alpha, beta, gamma. Um, okay, so this is this is one naming convention that one has to remember because directly people ask these questions. So Lyman is known by K, uh, the Balmer series that we were talking about here. Yes, so K alpha line, other if somebody's saying that uh, K, the K alpha line is has some free, have some wave, wavelength uh, 1 into 10 is power minus 7 let's just say so it means that the transition n is equal to 2 
to n is equal to one has that series. So k alpha corresponds to the transition from n is equal to two to n is equal to one. K beta uh, means n is equal to three to n is equal to one. Uh, and k gamma means n is equal to four to n is equal to one. Make sense? Now Barmer is denoted by n. Sorry, not m h, h alpha h, not uh, m h. Um, so uh, in the same way as you had k alpha, k beta, k gamma, you have h alpha, you have h beta, and you have h gamma. Which one would they be? Well, it's pretty obvious. If they are going to go to n is equal to two, so all of them are going to end up at n is equal to two. That's pretty. I mean, that's by definition. Um, so. But what are they coming from? Well, alpha is the first one, so it has to come from n is equal to three. Beta is the second one, so it has to come from n is equal to four. And gamma is the third one, so it has to come from n is equal to five. So this is these are naming conventions. So keep this in your head. Keep this in the background of your head always. So what we figured out here: n f is equal to two, and n i is just equal to three comma four comma five dot dot dot. So one by lambda is nothing but Rh one by four minus one by n i squared. Hmm. Again, uh, so the longest wavelength. Which transition would be the longest wavelength? See, when one is saying the longest wavelength, that means the smallest energy, right? Big wavelength equals to small energy. Okay. So H alpha. H alpha, absolutely. So the H alpha line will be the longest wavelength line in the Bama series. What about the shortest wavelength? H gamma. In in these three, absolutely. But the shortest wavelength will be H H actually infinity because it's actually N I will be equal to infinity. So one by lambda. Will just be R H one by four minus one by infinity squared, which is R H divided by four. So this implies lambda is just four by H. You can put in the numbers here and you can figure out what exactly uh, the wavelength is. But no need to do that. It's a it's a good practice to always put in the numbers. Um, this this uh, Bama series. Was I, I think Bama series was the first series that was actually discovered. It wasn't Lyman that was discovered. The first series was Bama that was discovered. Why that's the case is because these these lines, you will realize if you actually do the numbers, they lie in the visible spectrum. So, if you <laughs> if you if you're seeing anything, so uh, and if it's coming out from the hydrogen atom. Um, you you can be very very sure that it's part of the H series or the Palmer series. Roughly. So um, this is the Palmer. Let's move on to the next one, which is Bastion. B S C H E N Bastion series. Again, and is um, Lyman was any two n is equal to one. Uh, Palmer was two n is equal to two. So your nf here will be n is equal to three, and your ni will just be more than three, so four, five, six. So what is your one by lambda? Your one by lambda is rh one by three squared minus one by ni squared, which is just rh one by nine minus one by ni squared. Okay. Um, again, longest. Longest wavelength should just be the n i is equal to four to n f is equal to three transition, which will have a wavelength of r h one by nine minus one by sixteen, which is what? A very very weird number. Um, sixteen minus. Nine so seven divided by sixteen one sixty minus sixteen one fifty one forty four. Yes, 
7 divided by 144. So um, get lambda is just 144 divided by 7 RH. So this is the longest wavelength in the passion series. And similarly, the shortest wavelength will be again from Ni is equal to infinity to Nf is equal to 3, which is 1 by lambda, which is Rh, 1 by 9 minus 1 by infinity. This is just 0. And so this is just Rh by 9. So this implies shortest will be 9 by Rh meters. OK. Similarly, again, um, OK, huh. so this lies in the next region. So it was ultraviolet, then visible. Then this obviously has to be infrared because essentially you're moving uh, towards the longer wavelengths of light. This is the passion. The next one is the bracket. T. Uh, the bracket series um, said this is going to be from NF being equal to four and NI being equal to five, six, and seven, and so on and so forth. Uh, yes. Uh, so similarly, this is one by lambda is just going to be your RH times one by four squared. So that's 16, one by NI squared. Um, again, longest wavelength will be, uh, sorry, wave, L -E -N -G -T -H. wavelength would essentially be from NI is equal to five to nf is equal to four in this particular thing and the shortest you can put in the numbers and you can figure all of this out shortest wavelength should just be ni is equal to infinity to nf is equal to four and similarly for p fund uh, what you have is nf is equal to five and Ni is equal to six, seven, eight. So your longest wavelength would just be the transition from Ni is equal to six to Nf is equal to five. And your shortest should just be Ni is equal to infinity to Nf is equal to five. It's a good exercise to to plot uh, to to put all the numbers here uh, in order to see exactly uh, what the numbers are coming out to be. It's always a good good exercise to do that and both of these obviously lie even farther beyond in the infrared range now let's end the chapter uh, the bohr's atomic model by discussing some limitations limitations of the bohr atomic model First of all, um, the Bohr atomic model explains, so it explains, explains uh, the spectra of only the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen or hydrogen like atoms or uh, hydrogen. So let me just go back here hydrogen hydrogen or I just write it in brackets hydrogen like what do I mean by hydrogen like I mean uh, atoms which which have one electron in the valence uh, valence uh, shell so in the outermost shell we're just talking about one electron all of those all of those um, atoms the spectra more or less you can predict through Bohr's model but not other than that I don't like uh, so I'll just write it down uh, one electron in the balance shell in the balance orbit in sorry in the last orbit like that's not even right in the last orbit 
so in the outermost orbit there's only um, there's only one electron uh, it explains uh, the spectra of only the hydrogen or hydrogen like atoms that is um, atoms having only one electron Mm, such as uh, helium plus. Let's think about helium plus. It's an ion. It's not. Um, it's not uh, a neutral atom, but it only has one electron and two um, two two, new, uh, two protons and certain number of neutrons. Uh, He plus or lithium two plus. That also works. That will also only has one electron. It is safe. um so it fails to explain uh the spectra of uh multi electron atoms things get slightly complicated if you if you actually want to consider multiple electrons in a system not a multiple anything actually um second problem with this is well when a spectral line is observed is observed under a powerful microscope comma it is found to consist to consist of a number of of a number of closely spaced lines so you remember when i was talking about uh, there are these lines well it turns out if you if you have a really really strong microscope and if you if you actually look at that uh, that that band what you'll see is that even that band is made of really really small 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 bands which are very very close to each other um since we're looking from far away if you don't have that microscope it looks like one particular line but it's not really it's actually made of multiple lines and, and bore has no idea why this happens um so bore's atom atomic model fails uh fails to explain this is what is called the fine structure um the fine structure fine structure is something if you if you study physics you'll hear a lot um fine structure of spectral lines of the spectra let's just say that third it does not explain it does not explain the splitting of spectral lines into um uh, a number of mm, a num number of spectral lines uh under under the effect of a magnetic field so if you put a magnetic field or an electric field for that matter and electric field if you put a magnetic field or an electric field what you what you see is that these these lines that you had here that this near really really nice orbits are actually made of um, further sub orbits let's just concentrate on one let's just talk about this n is equal to uh, 3 here so what this n is equal to 3 would do it will actually break down into multiple 
for Angie, but the three it will be, break up into six, I think. Um, but uh, but it will break up into multiple sub orbits if there is a magnetic field uh, or if there is an electric field. If there is a magnetic field, this effect is called the Zeeman effect. The Zeeman effect. If it's the electric field, it's called the Stark effect. Not named after Tony Stark or his father, but yes, it's still Stark. Uh, there are two more points here. The fourth point being um, the Bose theory defines the orbits very precisely. What does this mean? It means that if you if you remember uh, when you were, we actually literally calculated the velocity of the L of the electron in the nth orbit and where it is, so the radius of the of the electron there orbit very very precisely, right? But that's a problem because that is in contradiction with uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Bohr's theory, the basis of Bohr's theory is classical. It's not quantum mechanical in nature. We realize that the world is quantum mechanical and not only the world, the atom is very, very quantum mechanical in nature. Classical mechanics cannot really, classically, you cannot really um, define position and, and momentum at the same time. That's a very, very, very big problem. Precisely um, defines the orbits very precisely. That is, it defines both the position and the momentum. and the momentum with complete certainty. With complete certainty. And hence um, this, uh, it uh, violates Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay, and the last point being, um, again, a, a problem with quantum mechanics, um, considers the electron to be a particle. I mean, remember when we calculated the force, we said, okay, there's a particle here, it has a force in this direction, and this is a centripetal force in this direction, and the forces have to be equal. Well, if it's a wave, you cannot really do that, can you? It considers electrons electrons only as particles mm, particles but as we know, electrons can exhibit wave nature as well. So yeah, that's it. That is essentially the chapter on uh, Bohr's atomic model. And next time what we're going to do is solve a lot of questions on this.